In today's video, we're going to learn about some clever Poles who set the foundations to cracking the Enigma. If you enjoy this video, you know what to do. Go down there and like and subscribe. It might surprise you to know that when Alan Turing and his fellow brainiacs turned their attention to cracking Enigma, they weren't starting from scratch. Enigma had already been broken and broken and broken again in the years leading up to the Second World War. I must say, uh, Alan Turing is the name that you hear of, right? It, there's no Polish name that you hear of when you when you learn about Enigma. It is Alan Turing. And so that's a shame if, if a major part of it was down to someone else or other people. This tremendous feat was achieved by a small team of Polish mathematicians who, though often forgotten, laid the foundations for one of the most important intelligence projects of the Second World War. This story begins in December 1918, after Poland regained its independence. Only three months later, the Soviets decided they wanted a piece of the pie and the Red Army invaded. But this wasn't the Red Army of World War II, far from it. Stalin's purges hadn't yet decimated the officer corps and consequently, many commanders were old at Tsarist officers. They were stuck in the old ways and didn't understand the importance of encrypting their radio messages. You would have thought they'd learned their lesson after Tannenberg, but the officers were still sending orders out over the radio with barely any encryption. In the words of Polish Colonel Mieczysław Szczesinski, messages were being transmitted either entirely plain text or encrypted by means of such an incredibly uncomplicated system <laughs> that for our trained specialists, reading the messages was child's play. In Poland, the army's cipher section picked up these Soviet transmissions and it wasn't long before they cracked the codes. Three months after the Polish-Soviet war began in February, Polish High Command was fully aware of Soviet battle plans, sometimes before Soviet soldiers were. That's amazing. Uh, because, you know, uh, things are sent over radio waves or, or, or similar. And so people have got to realise that if you tune into the right signal, you will hear what other people are, are sending. And so if you haven't, look, in these days where you're talking about war and you either haven't bothered encrypting it or it is so basic that it's not difficult for people to, to figure out, then you are such an idiot, right? <laughs> You're so stupid. It's common sense that people can, can tune in. That's how radio works, right? Toward the end of the war, defeat after defeat was inflicted on the Bolsheviks and largely due to cipher section intelligence, the Polish were able to snag some serious peace deal concessions. In early 1928, a mysterious package arrived at the Warsaw Customs Office. It was from Germany and apparently contained radio equipment. The officials thought nothing of it until the manufacturer got in touch and demanded the package be sent back immediately without inspection. Naturally, the Poles were curious and opened the box only to find a machine they didn't recognize. A team from Cypher Section were called in to examine it and they were fascinated. That Pokemon? It was an early commercial Enigma machine. After taking detailed notes on its operation, the machine was sent back to Germany as ordered. Why was it sent to Warsaw anyway? Does anyone know why it was sent to Warsaw? Why would it come from Germany? <laughs> why would Germany? That's puzzled me. That has really puzzled me. But maybe that, that little slip up has... Oh, that's not even a small slip up. That is a complete disaster gave the Poles some serious, serious leeway in, in this being able to decipher it, isn't it? Wow. So puzzling. But now, Cypher Section knew the Germans were up to something. In the early 1930s, the German military began using modified Enigma machines, like the one from the customs office, to transmit encrypted messages. Throughout the decade, German manufacturers secretly improved Enigma's design. Even with their extensive prior knowledge, messages sent on later Enigma machines confounded Polish codebreakers. Remembering the role intelligence played in their victory during the Polish-Soviet War, 
the Polish army decided to throw its weight behind the codebreakers at Cypher section. They got a budget increase, several hand-picked mathematicians from Poznan University, and were renamed to the Cypher Bureau. One of their new recruits was Marian Rievski, who began working for the army as a cryptologist in 1930. Having had their eyes on Rievski for some time, the Polish intelligence service offered him, and several others, a spot on a secret cryptography training course. The workload was immense, and only three students passed. Mm -hmm. In 1932, Enigma transmissions were becoming increasingly frequent, and the Poles were, rightfully, getting nervous. Time was wearing on, and they were no closer to cracking the machine's secrets. That was until Rievski started working on it. After taking one look at Cypher Bureau's methods, he scrapped them. These old methods relied on letter frequency analysis and linguistic patterns to break the cipher. For example, E is the most common letter in German and appears around 17% of the time. So the Poles expected to find a substitute letter for E around 17% of the time too. Great in principle, but not when it comes to Enigma. In an Enigma machine, E could become several different letters which messed up the probabilities. Additionally, several different letters could all come out of the machine as an E, making things even tougher for the codebreakers. I'll be honest, I don't really know much about the Enigma, um, so I'm learning here. <sighs> I, these people that, you know, do these tasks, so for example, like, what was it, Rzeski? Riz uh, sorry, I've completely forgotten the, the name now. Um, it, they have that mind for it, don't they? Hang on. I'm just seeing what it was called. Rzevsky, Rzevsky. Um, They have that mind for it, don't they? Where they can think outside the box and other people just can't even comprehend what they are able to, to think. And they're so smart. I, I, I would just love to have even an ounce of their intelligence. I'm not a stupid person, but I would love to have even an ounce of what these guys have. Codebreakers. But this is where Ryevsky's theorem came in. Using pure mathematics, something that had never been done before in cryptography, Ryevsky put together a theorem that explained the relationships between letters inside the Enigma machine. It was groundbreaking stuff and has even been touted as the theorem that won World War II. Mm -hmm. But Ryevsky wasn't working alone. He had some serious help. Not from other codebreakers, as few could match his mathematical skill, but from the French, who were neck deep in espionage. Happy to help out anyone working against the Germans, the French intelligence service passed top secret Enigma documents onto the Polish codebreakers. But where did they get the documents? Hans Thilo Schmidt, the brother of Wehrmacht General Rudolf Schmidt, lived quite an extravagant life. He greatly enjoyed throwing large sums of money around and generally playing the role of a big shot. Sadly, the meager salary he earned from his position in the German Armed Forces Cypher office just wouldn't cover his expenses. Unlike his brother, Hans was no friend to the Nazis and believed they were ruining Germany. To get back at them and fund his high rolling at the same time, oh. Hans offered to sell Enigma documents to French intelligence. He was given the codename Asher, and his secrets were passed on to Gustave Bertrand, the head of French radio intelligence, who in turn passed them on to Polish mathematicians. For the Poles, these documents proved to be a gold mine. Asher provided them with cipher keys, duplicate plain text, and encoded messages and even instructions for operating an Enigma machine. Combined with what they already knew about Enigma, the Poles had all they needed to crack the code. Wow, uh, I had no idea about old Schmitty boy. Um, that's, it's, it's interesting because you know, there were Germans that didn't agree with what was going on. And, and that's so interesting because actually he was almost doing it it, it seemed like Schmidt was doing it for different reasons. Obviously, personal gain, obviously, but that's the same with a lot of people. Um, his dislike for what's going on as well. And 
what? <laughs> These are the things you don't learn about, and, and it's fascinating. By early 1933, Polish cipher bureau was regularly decrypting German radio traffic. So as long as documents from Usher kept coming, they could keep up with everything the German military was up to. But Usher wouldn't be around forever. One mistake could land their German mole in a Gestapo torture chamber and leave the Poles in the dark again. But luckily for the Allies, Usher was careful. Multiple Gestapo investigations sought to discover the source of radio intelligence leaks before the war started, but they never suspected Hans. As the brother of a respected general, he was politically untouchable. Hans knew his connections were buying him out of trouble, but he still enjoyed seeing the Gestapo crawl around looking for traitors, only to come back with nothing. From 1936 onwards, German High Command began implementing new procedures that made Enigma drastically harder to break. They reset the plug boards more often, switched the rotor positions daily, and tightened up radio net security. New techniques had to be developed by the code breakers, and they were successful, but it was taking them longer and longer to break the encryption. To expedite the process, Rievsky designed and built an electromechanical machine called Bomber. It was essentially an aggregate of six Enigma machines and was used together with the traditional longhand methods. With an efficient team, Bomber could work out the daily Enigma cipher key in about two hours. I never got round to watching the imitation game. Um, maybe I should. Maybe I, I watch these videos and I learn about things and I end up having to watch so much stuff off the off YouTube films and documentaries. The Imitation Game is another one that I probably need to watch, right? This feat of engineering kept Polish generals informed of virtually all German plans. When the Wehrmacht invaded on September 1st, Polish High Command knew 95% of the German order of battle. Knowing what the Germans were planning, Polish High Command ordered Cypher Bureau give all the intelligence it had to French and British representatives in July 1939. Rievsky and his mathematicians handed over a reconstructed Enigma machine, a bomber, instructions on how to break the code longhand, and records of German intercepts to both countries. The gift, as it was called, <laughs> represented Poland passing the code-breaking baton to France and Britain for the rest of the war. During the handover, a British officer asked Rievsky the most pressing question everybody had about the Enigma machine. How were the letters arranged on the entry drum? This question confounded the Brits for years, but for the Poles, it was obvious. They guessed that the well-ordered Germans would organize everything in alphabetical order. They were correct, and the Brits were dumbfounded. When Poland was lost to the German advance, Cypher Bureau burned all of its documents and- Hang on, I just want to go back to that. So, they, they, it says they had considered this possibility but rejected it as it was too obvious. How often do you get asked a question, for example, and it seems like it's too obvious to be the right answer. So you don't give the obvious answer and you have to, you think, but it's something that's natural, isn't it, to us that that's too simple. Surely it must be more complicated, but sometimes no. Sometimes the most obvious thing is the actual answer and, and it happens all the time. You know, it's it's quite often when you when when you listen to quizzes on the radio or quiz shows and stuff, and and there's an answer that seems too simple, and yeah, normally you have to go with what you actually think is the answer rather than overcomplicating things. When Poland was lost to the German advance, Cipher Bureau burned all of its documents and destroyed all its equipment, but their vital contribution to the war effort lived on in England. Gordon Welchman, a Bletchley Park mathematician and cryptologist stated, Ultra, the Enigma code-breaking project, would never have gotten off the ground if we had not learned from the Poles in the nick of time, the details of the Enigma machine and of the operating procedures that were in use. Captured, tortured and executed, none of those who worked at Cypher Bureau spilled the beans about their discoveries. Most were killed in prison camps during the later years of the war, and their enduring silence allowed their comrades overseas to capitalize on a decade of Polish code-breaking work. 
That was the story of the Polish Brilliant. mathematicians who first broke Enigma and laid the foundation for the most important intelligence operation of the entire Second World War. But what do you think? It's just fantastic. You know, and in the end, they, sacrif they, they, they almost sacrificed what they had for the greater good. And, and it's such a shame. And it's not just, obviously, you know, I'm on the, on the discovery of Poland. And it's not just Polish things that, you know, certain Poles had, had achieved and discovered that was actually taken credit for by other people. It's not just Poles. It happens everywhere um, where certain people will, will discover things and others take the credit for it. It happens all the time, everywhere, and it sucks. But the, the achievement was immense, right? The achievement was immense. And it's fascinating to learn about the people underneath what's currently recognized. And that's fantastic. These people are so smart and think outside the box. And I, I just imagining what goes through their heads sometimes. It's almost unimaginable from, from normal people. You know, it's like Stephen Hawking, for example, the things that he must have thought about and been able to to dream up compared to a normal person. It's fantastic. And um, everyone involved in these sort of things need to be appreciated for sure. Not just Alan Turing, for example, in this situation, but fascinating. I hope you found that interesting and enjoyable. Please do uh, make sure you like and subscribe and I'll catch you on the next one.